All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second to last class of the um, summer, <laughs> doesn't feel like summer here in Boston, the summer music <laughs> series. Um, today we're gonna have Megan DeBroat uh, giving us a class on Kepler and the Harmony of the Worlds. Um, so I just want to um, welcome everybody. I'm really happy to see people from all over the country and probably all over the world. Um, so the way we've been doing these is um, Megan will give her presentation and then we'll open it up for question and answer at the end. And if you have a question, you can push the raise your hand button and we'll go through it that way. Um, and just next Sunday will be the last class of our series, which will be given by Mihua Sager on Beethoven's compositional method. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce my dear friend, Megan. Thank you very much. Um, so before I start, let me just say number one, I think I have way too much material. So I am going to attempt to not go over time. Um, but as people know from the description of this class, our topic today is to explore the origin of the musical scale and the relationship of that to the planets of our solar system. However, in a sense, the real topic today is the classical principle. That is, that music is not sound. Now naturally, sound is involved when we perform and listen to music. However, the actual music as such is not in the notes. It's not in the sounds, but it's between them, behind them. It's in the motion of the mind. We hear this in the counterpoint of Bach when it's well performed. We hear this in the German lead. We hear this in art songs. We hear this in beautifully sung folk songs in Beethoven symphonies. But we also hear it, or don't hear it maybe, <laughs> experience it in the musical scale. Now, the intervals and the notes of the musical scale are not an arbitrary invention. And I just want to pause here to mention that there have been some really nasty attacks in the recent week on, of all people, Ludwig von Beethoven. And one of them was an article in Vox, I think they also have a podcast, and another in The New Yorker. And both of these articles say that Beethoven's music epitomizes and reinforces the racism and classism of the classical musical world. Now, obviously, has there been a problem of elitism and racism in the classical musical concert halls and environment? Sure, absolutely. But is that due to Beethoven's music? And um, while there are many things that could be said to just rip these articles apart, and I've already some very sharp counterattacks have been issued, the thing I want to say is that it displays the complete incompetence and ignorance of the authors of where the musical system comes from, of where this music comes from. And it suffers from the same fatal flaw of many of the attacks we're witnessing on classical culture today, which is that it refuses to recognize anything universal about the creative process, anything universal about the human mind. Now, that said, the musical system. Now, what I mean by the musical system here is the lawful structure of the domain of sound and the principles that govern it. The musical system had to be discovered, uncovered over many millennia, and it's developed much like a language develops. This lawfulness or maybe non-arbitrariness of the musical system is hinted at by the fact that we find the same intervals at the basis of the musical scales of cultures all around the world, sometimes very different cultures in India, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in the United States. Now, while this lawfulness exists, it was not decisively demonstrated until approximately 400 years ago, and not by a musician, but by an astronomer, 
Johannes Kepler, who I'd like to introduce you to. So let me just go back to the beginning here. So here's Kepler, and we don't have time to go much into Kepler himself, but I do want to mention that Kepler lived from 1571 to 1630, and he spent most of his life in what is today the southern part of Germany and Prague and the area in between. And he lived during the last phase of what was almost 150 years of horrible, terrible religious warfare which ravaged Europe. And Kepler himself suffered many, many personal hardships. And yet, Kepler was absolutely convinced of the goodness and the beauty of the universe. And he was absolutely convinced that it was created such that human beings could come to understand it. So he says in one of his earliest writings, we perceive how God, like one of our architects, approached the task of constructing the universe with order and pattern and laid out the individual parts accordingly as if it were not art that imitated nature, but as if God himself had looked to the mode of building of man who was to be. So from the time Kepler was a very young man, he was hungry to understand why the planets of the solar system of which at the time they knew of six up through Saturn, why the planets in our solar system lay at the particular distances from the sun that they did and not other ones, and why they moved with the motions that they did, why they moved with the speeds that they did and not otherwise. And in order to finally conclusively answer that question, Kepler turned not to mathematics, not to any other field, but to music. And before we get into what Kepler did with the musical scale itself and, and how he applies that to the planets, I wanna come back to what I said a few minutes ago at the opening, that music is not sound. And Kepler would quite agree. Um, very importantly, Kepler played a prominent role in fighting to destroy the influence of Aristotle over science and thinking generally. And he fought particularly against the Aristotelian idea that the soul, the mind, is nothing but a blank slate, a blank um, tablet. And this uh, was exhibited in Aristotle's De Anima on the soul, which is ironic because Aristotle doesn't really believe in the soul, um, where Aristotle says that the mind can be compared to a blank writing tablet upon which nothing is written. And through our experiences and via the senses, information and therefore ideas and thoughts about the world around us comes to be written on the, on the mind and on the soul. Now on the contrary, Kepler firmly believed that the human mind is an image of the mind of the creator. And therefore certain concepts are innate, innate to the human mind. And they don't come to us because we heard them or saw them or touched them. And in his book, The Harmony of the World, which he published in 1619, Kepler makes very clear what he thinks about the primacy of the mind over the senses. He says, certainly the mind itself, if it never had the use of an eye at all, would demand an eye for itself for the comprehension of things which are placed outside it, and would lay down laws for its structure which were drawn from itself. For the recognition of quantities, which is innate in the mind, dictates what the nature of the eye must be. And therefore, 
the eye has been made as it has, oh, as it is, because the mind is as it is, and not the other way around. Now, from this standpoint, Kepler considered the musical issue of consonance and dissonance. And he insisted that this is something which is recognizable by instinct without prior teaching. And I think most of you have probably experienced this. I have a quick example to illustrate what I mean in case you don't know what I'm referring to. Um, so I'll play two musical intervals. One of them is consonant and one of them is dissonant. Um, I won't tell you which one, but you'll probably know right away. Um, the, the audio on this might be a little soft, so you might want to raise your volume. So here's the first one. I'll play it again. And here's the second one. Okay, so hopefully everyone would agree that the first sound was dissonant. It clashed. It was unpleasant. And the second sound was beautiful. It was harmonious. Now, Kepler wanted to know why. What is the cause of certain intervals being beautiful and other intervals being abhorrent or, or um, tense and, and dissonant. Now, the ancient Greeks whom he studied built, they, they had a concept of this and they built the musical scale based on a certain principle of harmony. However, their harmony was based on the property of numbers. Now, for, so for example, they took um, string lengths. So can you, if you can imagine a, um, just a, a vibrating string, like a guitar string or a cello string. And if you pluck it, it makes a sound. And the Greeks discovered, or uh, maybe not the first, but they discovered that strings which were in the lengths of the ratio of two to one made a harmonious sound. Strings in the ratio of three to two made a harmonious sound. Three to four, four to five, and so on. And they, um, so they, they built their scale upon this, but Kepler has a problem with it. He, he notes that according to the reasoning of the Greeks who um, ascribed the harmonies to the properties of number alone, that the numbers one, two, three, their squares four and nine, and their cubes eight and 27, although they sort of threw 27 out the window, um, were the basis of the proportions of the musical scale. But Kepler had a problem with this. Number one, he said, if you follow that reasoning, then certain intervals which are clearly dissonant should be included, and they can't be. But more than that, Kepler rejected the idea that number alone was the cause of consonance or harmony because he said this mere number cannot be the cause of physical phenomena, a physical harmony. So instead, Kepler looked at, he said, okay, if man's mind is an image of the creator, then we have to look at what proportions are knowable to the human mind, knowable and therefore constructible by the human mind. And so, in order to experiment with this, he went to the realm of geometry. So here, you have an image of a circle. And within that circle, there's a triangle. Now you notice that the, the vertices of the triangle divide the circumference of the circle into three equal parts. So with any given circle, no matter what the size, it's possible using a compass and a straight edge to construct the length 
which divides the circumference into three equal parts. And from that, we generate the triangle. This is true of the square, of the pentagon, of the hexagon, of the octagon, and also all of the divisions, which are doubles of those, like the 10-sided figure, the 12-sided and 16-sided figure, and so on. However, it's not true of the seven-sided figure, nine-sided, 11, 13, and so on. And in his book, The Harmony of the World, Kepler has a really beautiful proof that in the realm of planar geometry, of the flat plane in which the circle exists, in that realm, not even God can construct the ratio which creates the seven-sided figure with a single act. And he said that because the seven-sided figure and the nine-sided and others are actually shadows or projections from the higher realm of conics, of three-dimensional figures. So I'm sort of compressing a, a lot, um, a lot of work into this, but Kepler really drove, uh, dove rather, dove into examining what was knowable and uh, what was knowable to the mind and what could human beings use in constructing the world around them. Um, so instead of taking the mere numbers, Kepler takes these divisions that are made possible by the knowable divisions of the circle. He takes that, those divisions, and he projects them onto that vibrating string that I was talking about. So in other words, he takes the constructible triangle and divides the string into three parts. The square divides it into four, the pentagon into five, and so on. And each of these knowable divisions of the string produces a very interesting phenomenon. So I have a, a little animation to show this, and I just want to give a disclaimer that I made this many years ago, and um, the sound is kind of wonky, but I think you'll I think you'll get um, an idea of the phenomenon that that's being exhibited here. So let me go here. Okay, so what you'll hear is you'll hear the sound of the the entire length of the string. You'll hear uh, the length of four fifths of the string with it. And you'll also hear the length of one fifth of the string, kind of the short side of the division of the string. And then you'll hear all of them together. So let me play this. Okay, so I'm just going to leave this up here for a sec. So that the highest sound is a little bit out of tune, I apologize. But the idea is, and if you really did this experiment, you would see that if you make a single division, here our division is we um, measured and divided the string at four fifths. If we pluck the whole string, the long part of the division and the short part of the division all at the same time, we have three tones, all of which sound beautiful together. And Kepler called this a harmonic division. So it's one division which produces three tones which create a unity, a beautiful consonance. And if we play all of the harmonic divisions within the octave in order, here's what we get. Hopefully that uh, sounded familiar to you, some approximation of the musical scale today. 
Now the question is, what happens when we play um, or we hear a proportion created by one of those inconstructible figures like the seven-sided figure? Well, here's a division of five-sevenths. Play it one more time. It's a little hard to hear. So hopefully you could tell that it's not very beautiful. So here's what Kepler said of this. Since it is mind, now mind, he means the creator's mind, the divine mind. Since it is mind which shaped human intellects in such a way that they would delight in such an interval, he means a consonant interval, the causes of such intervals being harmonious should also have a mental and intellectual essence. That is, that the terms of the consonant intervals are properly known or are unknowable. For if they are knowable, then they can enter the mind. But if they are unknowable, then they have remained outside the mind of the eternal craftsman. So I think that's really incredibly beautiful and it also again takes on the Aristotelian notion that we are just passive recipients of sense perception and uh, Kepler actually devotes many, many, many pages in his book to attacking the idea that hearing music, hearing the scale even, hearing the musical, um, hearing melodies and, and musical intervals is a passive act. He says, no, in order to recognize an interval as harmonious, we have to be able to recognize the knowability in it. We have to be able to recognize something about it which, make, which makes it beautiful to us. And, and he further points out, he says, look, what is an interval? Well, you have two sounds, which are two separate sounds, which exist outside the mind. They're received into the mind. And only in the mind are they made one. Is a unified concept created of them that can only occur by an action of the mind. And so this issue of knowability becomes really central to this. Now, it's from that series of knowable harmonic divisions that Kepler goes on to derive the major and the minor musical scales. And we see here, here we go. Um, we see a graphic that was remade from his book with the, the, on the top it says hard melody, that's the major scale. And we see the divisions and propor the proportionate divisions of the string that create the notes of the major scale. And on the bottom we have, oops, we have the minor scale and the intervals that I've covered up there, but <laughs> there we go. Um, the ratios which create the minor scale. Now, before moving on and um, looking a little bit at the solar system, I want to raise a problem or a crack that arises in this musical system. So I want you to think about the major scale. So we can begin the major scale on the open string, the, the first note that we would pluck the longest string length. Um, or we could, could begin it on the next note up, or the next note up. So here's a quick example of what I mean. OK, 
Okay, so we have three major scales, each one starting on one note higher from the original scale. Now, you can imagine the same would be the case with the minor scale. But I want to take a look here at what happens um, if we begin the minor scale, in this case, on a different note than the original note of the whole string. Now, if um, the previous anime or the previous um, scales that I played you sounded just a little bit wonky, there's actually a reason for that. It wasn't that the cellist was out of tune. <laughs> Um, actually, I'll, I'll play it one more time so you can listen for what I mean. So if you have a good ear, maybe you notice that those scales, sound, the, sec the second and third scales sounded just a little bit off. Um, there's a reason for that. So if we look here, I'm going to try to make this intelligible here. Um, if I call the, the note, which is given out by the whole string, G. So that's our, our lowest note is G. If I make a division of five sixths, that's a minor third. So we go to the note B flat, right, which is sort of between A and B here. So from G to B flat is a minor third, a five sixths ratio. Now, if I start instead of G, if I start on A, the second note of the original scale, and I go up to the note C, that's also a minor third. But, but we expect the minor third to be a ratio of five to six. But if you do the math, as I have here, because the note A is already an eight ninths division of the original string, and the note C is a three fourths division of the original string, the interval between them is not five sixths. It's 2730 seconds. Now that might mean nothing to you, or right? What's okay? How far off is that, right? Um, it's about 99 or a little less than 99% the same as five sixths. Or put otherwise, it's about instead of five sixths, it's about 5.06 sixths, right? Five and a sixteenth sixths. So it's very, very close. It's a tiny difference. And if I played the two intervals in succession, you probably couldn't tell the difference. But if I play them at the same time, you will absolutely hear the difference. So we're going to hear that. So what this is, is I've taken the intervals of the A minor scale, and I've just moved it down so that it starts on G. So these are going to be the G minor scale and the intervals of the A minor scale, except I moved them down so that both of the scales start on G so that we can hear the differences between them. you could hear and, and see that these scales were not identical. And um, I know I'm sort of moving through this very quickly, but this is a real problem that has existed, does exist in musical history, which is often referred to as the problem of tempering. And what it means is that if you want to sing or play music in anything other than the key that you originally built the scale in, you find that it is riddled with these kinds of discrepancies. Sometimes it's not a problem and sometimes it is. Now here's a quick example. I'm going to play a few seconds of the Bach 
prelude in C from the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. The first one is going to be in the original key, right? The key um, that we've, that where all the, the divisions are harmonic. Okay, now if without changing the tuning of our strings, if we just transpose that up to C sharp, here's what we get. Okay, so hopefully that sounded horrible to, you, to everyone. Um, so again, this tempering could be a whole class and should, you know, could be a whole class in and of itself. Um, the important thing to say here is that Kepler addresses this problem in his writing, The Harmony of the World. He actually dedica dedicates quite a few pages to it. And he raises the paradox that there doesn't seem to be a good solution to this tempering problem, to this tuning problem. Um, so that's number one. He doesn't find a solution, or Kepler doesn't find a solution in music per se, but he does find a sort of solution when he turns his focus back to the planets of the solar system. So I want to end by returning to that, returning to that issue. Um, now, the idea that the motions of the heavens are harmonious or musical is a very, very old idea. It didn't originate with Kepler. It exists in many cultures. Again, you can look in the Vedic hymns. There are ideas in Asian culture that go back many, many, many centuries. Um, similarly, in Western culture, an idea that there's something harmonious about the motions of the stars and the planets in the sky. Um, so Kepler by no means invented that idea, but he did give it substance. So when approaching this question of why do, do the planets move with the motions that they do and not otherwise, he first asked himself, well, if I were the creator, if I were God, how would I have created the solar system such that it was the most beautiful and the most knowable to humanity who would eventually come along. And he asked himself, okay, if the harmonic ratios are to be found among the planets, in what feature, in what characteristic of the planetary orbits should I place them? In other words, should we look for the harmonic ratios in, among the distances of the planets from the sun? Should we look for them among the ratios of the time that it takes for each planet to orbit the sun in the year? Now, eventually, Kepler rejects both of those and, and several other things and finally decides that because the sun is the mover of the planets, the cause of their motion, that the ratios should appear to, uh, the harmonic ratios should appear from the vantage point of the sun. And so he hypothesizes that there would be harmonic ratios between each planet's extreme motions as seen by the sun. So let me try to illustrate that here. And this is a very exaggerated um, planetary orbit. But our planets orbit the sun not in perfect circles, but ellipses. And this is something that Kepler discovered a little more than a decade before he published The Harmony of the World. 
So the planets orbit the sun in ellipses, meaning that there is a moment in the planetary orbit when the sun is at its maximum distance, I'm sorry, the planet is at its maximum distance from the sun. And then opposite that, there's a moment when the planet is at its minimum distance from the sun. Those positions also correspond with the minimum at the farthest distance and maximum speed or motion of the entire orbit. So Kepler hypothesized that if you were standing on the sun, or if the sun had some kind of way of sensing it, that the ratio of the fastest and slowest motion of that planet ought to be a harmonic ratio. So here you see I've put the number four at the farthest distance and five at the closest distance, because that corresponds to the ratio of the apparent motion of Saturn at its aphelion and perihelion, at its slowest and fastest. So Kepler said, Saturn, to a viewer positioned on the sun, Saturn sings a perfect major third with itself, and its orbit is bounded by that harmonic interval. And it's the same with the rest of the planets in the solar system. So here you see um, a diagram from, or a remade diagram from Kepler's book with the harmonic intervals which each of the six known planets sings with itself. So Saturn sings a major third, Jupiter a minor third, Mars a fifth, almost. Now the Earth and Venus are a little bit different. They sing dissonant intervals, and Kepler hypothesizes a reason for that. And then Mercury, with the wildest orbit, sings an octave and a minor third with itself. So not only did Kepler discover that the motions of the planets are bounded by harmonic ratios. But he also discovered that the planets make harmonic ratios with their neighbors. And he did a little experiment where he took the lowest note of the solar system, which is Saturn's slowest motion. And if you just think real quick, if you pluck a string, the, low no the, the, the lower note vibrates more slowly than a string which is tightened to a higher note. That would vibrate more quickly. So he takes the slowest motion of the solar system, which is Saturn, and he calculates from Saturn's motion what, you know, again, if I were the creator, what motions would I make the planets go, or how fast would I make the planets go, such that I could construct the major scale and the minor scale against Saturn's lowest note. And once he makes those calculations and compares them to the actual data, he sees an almost perfect correspondence. So here you see the major scale and underneath the, the um, musical staff, you see the motions of the planets. So you see um, this number 106 seconds, that represents the motion of Saturn when it's its slowest. And then you see the other planets motions assume positions in the musical scale. And it's similar with the minor scale. If we again take the motion of Saturn, this time he takes the quicker motion and calculate what the notes of the minor scale ought to be, he finds that the other planets fit it almost exactly. Now, you notice that I said almost exactly. There are discrepancies. It's not perfect. And in a couple of cases, there are big discrepancies. But Kepler backs up and he says, well, let's think again about this issue of tempering and of having um, music which 
is not just in one key, but is in many keys. Or a different way to say it is, let's think about the case when, when music is not just homophonic, but polyphonic, where you have many voices, like a Bach fugue. In that case, if we treat the planets like a chorus, instead of like a bunch of rocks hurtling around the sun that just happen to you know, fall into the same region of the solar system, we get a better insight into this. So in a chorus, every singer, number one, has to be in tune with him or herself. Number two has to be in tune with his or her section so that there's a unified voice in the sopranos, in the altos, and so on. But each and every singer also has to be tuned in to every other voice in the chorus. And at every moment has to be listening and tuning into the whole. When you have a process like that, and, and it's actually probably a little bit easier to witness in the case of a string quartet, where it's a little bit smaller and um, perhaps a little clearer to the ear. When you do that, what you would find if you could measure the pitches that every singer or the pitches that each of the members of the quartet were playing, you would not find those perfect numerical ratios. You would find ratios which are a little bit larger or a little bit smaller and intervals which in and of themselves are a little bit imperfect tempered, mixed, but the harmony is no longer in the individual voice, it's in the whole. And so for time reasons, I decided I would not try to take you through Kepler's, um, when Kepler reapproaches the solar system from that standpoint, but hopefully it suffices to say, to tell you, and maybe let this be a um, provocation um, to, to work on Kepler yourself, Kepler goes back through the solar system and hypothesizes, if I wanted these planets to not just be in tune with themselves or their neighbors, but to have as, as much, um, to have each planet tuning, so to speak, with as many others as possible, I would have to make slight adjustments to their motion in this precise way. And he walks, he walks through that. And when he does that, what he comes up with is a system which is tempered, just as a chorus is tempered. Um, anyway, it's, it's incredibly beautiful. And when I was working through this, I realized that Kepler really solved the tempering problem um, about 150 years before Bach, or maybe it's, yeah, about 150 years before Bach did. And his solution the reason I say that is because Kepler, again, coming back to our opening theme, Kepler locates the issue of music, of sound, of tuning, of tempering in the mind. The primary thing is in the motion of the mind. And it's not just an arbitrary mind, it's a mind which is an image of the creator of the universe, or a mind which expresses a certain universal creative principle which is common to all human beings. And so from that standpoint, I think he actually opened the door and made possible the revolution that Bach later carried out with his compositions, with his well-tempered clavier, with his fugues, um, and, and, and the kind of um, enrichment of the musical language that we owe to Bach. So I, oh, I, I'm going to end it there. I have one final quote that I want to read before we open it up for questions. So this is from the, uh, the Harmony of the World. Therefore, the motions of the heavens are nothing but a kind of perennial harmony in thought, not in sound, through dissonant tunings, like certain syncopations or cadences by which men imitate those natural dissonances and tending towards definite and prescribed resolutions, individual to the six terms as with vocal parts. So the six terms, he means the six planets. 
and marking and distinguishing by these notes the immensity of time. Thus, it is no longer surprising that man, imitating his creator, has at last found a method of singing in harmony which was unknown to the ancients, so that he might play, that is to say, the perpetuity of the whole of cosmic time in some brief fraction of an hour by the artificial concert of several voices and taste up to a point the satisfaction of God his maker in his works by a most delightful sense of pleasure felt in this imitator of God, music. So I will stop it there and open it up for questions. Wonderful, thank you. All right. Um, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand, click the raise hand, and if you can't figure out how to do that, just write in the chat <laughs> that you have a question. <clears throat> Oh, <laughs> thank you, David. <laughs> if people didn't see that, David has, David Shaven has tempered my um, estimate of time, <laughs> but it's about a hundred years to Bach. Yes, that's true. <laughs> well, I've either stunned everybody or confused everybody. <laughs> I do have a question. Yep. Can I, can you? Um, two questions. This is Joe in Houston. Okay. Um, so in your, in your major scale, uh, going up, uh, it seemed there was a, something called vacant, uh, <laughs> a, a space unfilled. I was wondering if you could say something about that. And also, um, with the later discovery of Uranus and Neptune did the same harmonious patterns, uh, uh, manifest themselves, you know, in the undiscovered planets that we you know, came to understand. Um, be sure. Let me go back to the slide here. Yeah, and it, you didn't catch it, but there's a vacant one in the minor scale, too. Um, yeah, so there's, in Kepler's planetary scale, there's no planet that sings the second note of the major scale, the A in this, in this case. But in the minor scale, there's no planet that sings the second to last note. So Kepler noticed for sure, you know, <laughs> he, um, he noticed that it was there, it didn't seem to be perfect. Um, he wasn't terribly worried about it. He did note the symmetry, which is, something to note, I don't know exactly what it says, but he did make note of the symmetry, the fact that it's the first, the second note from the bottom in the major scale and the second note from the top in the minor scale, which are vacant. Um, those notes are dissonant, although of course there are some other dissonant positions in the scale which are taken. So, I, I mean, I don't know quite what to say about it except for that. Um, I mean, I guess I would also, could also add that he, um, I think he really found the certainty of the of the discovery in the tempering process that I kind of quickly described. Um, I think he wasn't terribly thrown off by some of the imperfections of the data um, because what he really was um, looking for was the kind of um, the kind of tempering and adjustment process that you see in polyphonic music. So anyway, there's, there's probably more to explore there, but that's what I could say about it. Now on your second question about the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, no, they're not harmonic, which is totally fascinating. Um, they, um, they're quite dissonant, actually. Um, so I think that's just something that we need to explore. It obviously means that Kepler's discovery is not the whole picture, right? Um, 
it's not, it can't account for that. So I did start looking many years ago, I did start looking not at the outer planets, but I started looking a little bit at the, um, the bigger asteroids in the asteroid belt because they're also dissonant. And obviously the asteroid belt's not a planet, it's a huge rubble field. Um, but I think, you know, Kepler went so far and I think there's, there are certain discoveries, number one, that have been made, but perhaps also must be made um, about the musical system, which could be then applied to look back at what Kepler did and perhaps bring up to date, modify or subsume what Kepler did. So yeah, I think it's quite exciting actually. Oh, and then one more thing is that my friend Ian sent me a link that I have not yet read, but he says that um, Kepler's harmonies were discovered in some exoplanets. So that's really exciting. Megan, there are a couple of questions in the chat here. I'm just gonna read them, okay? Yep. The first question is from Ian Overton. It says, I heard that the planets in our solar system were in harmony when Kepler figured them out but the orbits don't show harmonies today. Why is that? Yes, so um, the orbits and the motions of the planets aren't fixed. They change over time. And Kepler was aware of that. He um, actually wrote letters to some friends indicating that he, this was later in his life, he wrote letters to friends indicating that he intended to um, explore and uh, figure something out about the secular perturbations of the orbits, or in other words, how the orbit, how the ellipticity of the orbits changes over time. Um, what we do know is that the planetary orbits, the, the particular ellipse that they're in, it's not always like that. It, it kind of oscillates between being a little bit more elliptical and a little bit less and a little bit more. And um, Kepler had every intention to, like, you know, now that he made those discoveries, to now take this on and incorporate that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, again, I think that's a challenge to future and current scientists to take on. Okay, another question here in the chat. Um, Susan B. asks, can you play the Bach prelude in C and then in C sharp again and discuss what you said was wonky in the transposition? Sure. <laughs> I'm hoping you can hear what was wonky. Um, it doesn't always come through in the, you know, computer world. Uh, here we go. Okay. Okay, so... I'll play the first one, the, the prelude in C. And this was done on a keyboard where the notes were tuned to those perfect um, ratios that Kepler used to build the scale, okay? So you'll hear the first few seconds of Bach's prelude and fugue played on a piano that was tuned according to Kepler. Okay, now, without changing the tuning of any of those notes, we just pick up our hands and we play the same thing in C sharp. Susan, was that more clear? I, I hear that, can you hear me? Yeah. I hear a difference um, and I hear a color difference. I just wasn't sure, oh. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I just wasn't sure. Um, I, I would like you to elaborate on why it was more wonky. Sure, let me. Um, <laughs> If there is a yeah. color difference, that's obvious, but right. if that's what you meant, then that's 
that that's one of the differences. Yes. Um, just pulling up the place I pulled this from. Turn that mute off. Okay. On. Okay. So let me. Oh my. Okay, so here, I don't know if this helps at all, but, or if you can see it, um, but here we have just a little diagram of the, of the, the, well, three scales, but let's concentrate on the top two. So on the left, you see the C scale. So that's your do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. And on top, I wrote in blue the ratios of the neighboring notes, right? So the, the interval between the first two notes is eight ninths, the next two notes is nine tenths, and so on. For the C sharp scale, the interval between the first two notes is not eight ninths. It's something, I forget if that's smaller or bigger, but that's something just a little bit off, right? The interval between the next two is, is the same, it's nine tenths, but the next interval is not 15 sixteenths, it's something a little bit different. So what that ends up creating is not just differences in neighboring notes, but it means that, for example, um, I think in, in the C sharp scale, I think the fourth. So the interval from C sharp to G sharp, I think, is really dissonant. It shouldn't be. It should be consonant. It should be harmonious as, as in the C scale. But because of the little differences in these steps, it adds up to an interval of a fourth that's like really wonky and awful. And so that, that's, um, that's what gives different colors to the different keys. If, unless you have equal tempering, that's what gives colors to the different keys. But some of the keys have such dissonant um, intervals that they're, you can't play music in them unless you change the tuning. Or, yeah. Is that a little bit clearer? Yes and no. I kind of, I didn't hear, I was listening for, and maybe I just have to listen better, <clears throat> excuse me, but the dissonance that mm -hmm. you described, and I actually didn't, did you hear it? No, no, I didn't hear it so much, but um, what you just described in the fourth, for example, I just heard the overall difference. Now, maybe that's because you just have to listen to it more, which is possible. Yeah, so I'm going to play, I'm going to put in the chat the link to the web page. Now, I do want to give a disclaimer that many, unfortunately, many of the videos are broken, but I intend to fix them. <laughs> um, but the diagram that I was talking about and some of the um, audios are, are on there. Okay, Megan, some other things in the chat, I guess. Um, Anita, I don't know, Anita, I'm assuming you're asking Megan this. Um, some say the asteroid belt is an exploded non-harmonic planet. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, there's definitely something, um, very different about that area, that zone, I don't really like that word, but I'll use it, that zone of the solar system. Um, so I did some work many years ago just saying, okay, well, let me think like Kepler, now that we know there's an asteroid belt there, um, let me think like Kepler and try to find... Um, a platonic solid. He uses the platonic solids to help determine the distances. So let me use a, a solid to try to see if I can account for the distance of the asteroid belt from the sun and then think about the tuning that could possibly go with that. Um, and the interesting thing is, at least what I found, is that according to Kepler's method, it seems like you could have a planet there. So I'm not saying that I'm total, that I'm not missing something. Um, what I can say is that Kepler noted that there are that 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 the interval between Mars and Jupiter was really anomalous in many ways. Um, the, obviously, the distance between Mars and Jupiter is much much bigger than the distance between any other planets uh, proportionally. And um, anyway, so there so there are other anomalies about that space and that relationship between Mars. And Jupiter. I mean, now we know much more in terms of, um, you know, the different physics of what's the interactions between different planets. Um, but I, I was never quite 
satisfied with that push me, pull me kind of idea. So I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer to your question, but it, um, that, anyway, from both Kepler's work and more modern work, that area of the solar system is definitely kind of a, a phase, a phase shift, right? It's an unstable area where you shift from these rocky inner planets to these big gassy giants. So I think there's more investigation to do. Great. So just so people know, in order to raise your hand, you just go to the participants list and go to your name and click more, and then you can raise your hand. Or you can write it in the chat. It looks like that's the preferred method today. Okay, uh, Ian Overton says, the wonky seems to be in the upper notes of the prelude. If I recall, wasn't the Kepler scale only harmonious for one octave? So transposing it upward breaks the tuning? Um, it is harmonious for um, as many octaves. So how to say this? If you're like, let's say we um, tuned the strings in those perfect intervals. Let me actually pull up the graphic again so I can be less abstract. Oh, goodness. Uh, nope. Nope. Oh, my gosh. Apologies. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and get the right window up, and then I'm going <laughs> to share it with you. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, here. So if we, so here you have, this is bass clef, so this is a, a G major scale. Uh, the, the top one is a G major scale. So um, the note, which is an octave above the first G, is just this half string, right? So then if we took the second note of the scale and we just made a, a string which is half that length, four ninths, that would be an octave above. So you can go as many octaves as you want of the G major scale. The problem comes in when you, when you start the scale on a different note, like B natural, for example. So the, let's say this, you know, I would have to do the calculation, I don't remember exactly, but this fifth between um, B natural and F sharp um, I would have to calculate it, but anyway, um, depending on what note you start on, the fourths and the fifths and the thirds are not always um, the same as they were in the original scale. So that's where the wonkiness comes in. It's not the height or the depth of the pitch, but it's starting on a different note than the original tonic. Okay, great. There's another comment in the chat, and then we'll have Renee right after that, okay? And then Mary, and then I'll ask Mary's question. So Mike Billington says, Kepler said in one of your quotes that, quote, we can now sing in harmony, quote, impl sorry, end quote, implying they had already done a well-tempering of the scale before Bach. Comment? I don't think he quite meant that. Um, what he meant is polyphony. So he lives during a time where polyphonic music. There was really a, an explosion of the development of polyphony. Um, and, you know, to us, now living in an era of Bach and Beethoven and Haydn, etc., cetera, um, might sound a little primitive, but it's, it was actually incredibly revolutionary. And um, Kepler went to seminary at a university in Tübingen, Germany, where you had a really, really rich musical culture. And um, he just immersed himself in these the motets of Josquin de Pre, um, Orlando di Lasso, many other people. So that's that's what he was referring to. Not that they had solved the tempering issue per se, although with a chorus, it's not really an issue, right? Because um, because choral musicians can make those adjustments, but um, more so, he meant polyphony. And again, it's it's that um, the development of the art which necessitates the mechanical solution of tempering of abiotic instruments. Um, similar to the way that Kepler's discovery of the elliptical orbits necessitated the mathematics, the calculus that could could um, deal with it. So anyway, that's that's what he meant in my view. Hey, Renee, I have a question. Yeah, since you brought up this whole matter of the um, of the classical principle, I just wanted to point out and see what you have to say about this, which is that 
uh, at, when, once Bach did introduce through the voicing principle and the well-tempered clavier and similar things, that this was a solvable issue, a musical system was created, which by the middle of the 18th century created something that had never existed before in human civilization, which was, I mean, Lynn used the term, the fully developed classical orchestra, which I think is very relevant to this because when you actually get the orchestra together, the instruments are not in tune with each other. And you, the, the, the shadings that have result as a result of these these slight differences when you go from, I mean, there was a lot of work that was done con to construct the instruments to be close, a closer approximation of a, some kind of a universal tuning principle, which is where the, fourth, where the idea that an absolute central pitch comes in, you know, but there, all these woodwind instruments were redesigned and, and, and everything else. But when, by the 18, by 1750, approximately with Haydn, and then later Mozart, you actually get the fully developed classical orchestra. There's a higher principle of resonance comes in where the horn section, the brass, the woodwinds, and the strings, they're not all tuned together. And yet there's a higher resonance which supersedes the apparent limitation of what is in a, in a lower level development seems to be the difference, in other words, consonance and dissonance are not fixed, they're not numerical values. And it, and it does come down to the human mind because very often the reason that it works is because the musicians themselves alter the pitches while they're playing in order to bring a unity in. But sometimes they, they don't. I mean, in other words, it's a very subtle thing which, which, I, which also then affects the way composers even composed a single voice singing the lead with the piano. You know, sometimes, I mean, when you play octaves on a piano, you can introduce all kinds of dissonances that apparently be completely, you know, completely, hard. I mean, I have great difficulty characterizing consonances, dissonances, beautiful and horrible. I have a hard time with that <laughs> because because when you, it, I think people should play, I think people should do music in tune, but I think the concept involved is more complex. And certainly when you're working on string quartets and so forth, you know, you've, you've really got to be, you know, you, you've really got to be tuned to actually recognize how often this comes up. But once you get involved in like doubling the octaves in, in, in a combination of instruments, the whole, a whole new a whole new domain is opened up where these where these limitations don't exist anymore, which shows that there's a higher which have, which comes back to showing that there's a higher principle of resonance in the universe because the really classical orchestra is a beautiful example of something universal. I just want to throw that in, Sujit. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, you know what? Well, there's a lot. To, you said a lot. There's a lot to say, but. Um, you know, I think one of the most important things in my view that Kepler did is just bust the idea that it's in the numbers, that it's some kind of one-dimensional mathematical problem. Um, to me, that's the most important thing, and that I think somehow, not in some, you know, billiard ball kind of way, but somehow that made Bach possible. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Um, but yeah, what you said about tuning in the orchestra, you have, you have um, colors, you have registers, you have all these different things, and, and you're right, it, it there is a much higher um, principle of, of tuning and harmony than some kind of um, linear, just one-dimensional or two-dimensional scale of it. So yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Which he had the kind of mind that he could have thought that, and I think it's useful to keep in mind that, you know, Lynn's observation that a lot of his, his knowledge of music, for say, musical composition, came from Galileo's father. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if you want to say, I'm sure you've thought about that, but, but I think, you know, that Galileo was definitely, an, his father too, were Aristotelians and, and were moving in a different direction than, than the Renaissance. Yeah, no, he read Vincenzo Galilei, absolutely. Um, he got really angry about what he did with tempering. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. He, but he read a lot. Um, he read what was available to him, and that was one of the big, he actually had 
just like everybody of that day, um, he had trouble getting his hands on texts that he wanted to read. Um, he actually wanted to read Ptolemy's writings on harmony for years, and finally one of his um, patrons got it, got it to him. Um, he read Boethius, but he also, uh, I mean, I, I think he was very strongly impacted by the music itself. Because if you read in, in the book, in the harmony, when he talks about the motets of Orlando, there's a real passion in his writing that is just not academic. So I can't help but think that that also, you know, somehow stuck with him, shaped his thinking. Great. Okay, um, Mary Crosby has a question in the chat. You mentioned Kepler applied geometry to the string. Could you say more about that? Yeah, so he, um, rather than looking at the divisions of the string that create these notes of the scale, just from the standpoint of the number, and, um, you know, taking a length of string, it's easy enough to measure it and then divide that into three, for example, um, and, and mark off a third and play the right note. But he said, that doesn't tell me why certain intervals are consonant and other intervals aren't. Right, it's easy enough for me to measure a string and divide it into any um, number of parts that I want if I'm just using number. So he went to the properties of constructive geometry and I, I, I went through it very quickly, but he spends a long time, actually I can show the book that I've been talking about the whole time. Um, this is his, an English translation of his writing, The Harmony of the World. But he, um, he spends a long time going through the features of constructible, the constructible polygons, how from just a circle, we can construct um, the diameter, we can construct the division of the circumference into three parts. And I mean, that, that if you've never tried it, that might seem like a simple enough problem, but it's not. <laughs> if you draw a circle on the paper with your compass and have a ruler and a compass, and try to divide that circle's circumference into three parts, it's not as easy as it sounds. And there are certain principles of space governing that. Um, so Kepler took geometry, the, the, he explored the concept of these ratios in the domain of geometry and felt that he got a certain insight into why certain intervals as he put it, couldn't enter the mind, didn't make sense to the mind, and therefore felt uh, a dissonant, felt dissonant to the mind. So again, that's sort of shorthand, but um, without actually working through it, that would be the best I can do for now. But I would just encourage you to, um, I've given many classes on this, and also we have a couple of websites. One of them is the one I put up, but I can put up a, a second one also. Wonderful. Okay, there's another comment in the chat that you can comment on, and then I'll take Diane's question, who has her hand raised. So this is from Oswaldo. Megan, I remember having read a meeting of LaRouche with scientists, where he, with, a, with scientists where he placed a request to them to study the process of the condensation of a huge plasma sphere or a pa para, sorry, parabolid subject, subject to a soft magnetic perpendicular field. And later on, some scientists came out with a solution that the condensation were in analyses whose distance from the center were found mathematically. They were distributed in a harmonic geometry. Uh, there are two things I could think of that you might be referring to, um, which are different, though not unrelated. One of them is um, his discussion with scientists in the Fusion Energy Foundation on the fact that um, the solar system must have been created by some process of polarized fusion um, from the sun. Um, and that would explain the, the um, existence of elements beyond iron in the periodic table. And there were some experiments done, I think at Lawrence Livermore, showing that that is entirely possible. The second thing I can think of is work that was done by Dr. Dan Wells on um, the formation of the solar system and its distribution into the Keplerian orbits. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, to be honest, that's work that I looked at about a decade ago, and I can't remember the particularities of it, but there is, uh, there are actually a couple of articles printed in Fusion magazine 
by, um, written by Dan Wells, where he goes through that. So that might be a place to look. Great. Okay, Diane. Hmm. I think she's unmuted. Yes. Whoops. Now, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I just have a hypothesis and I'd like to test it. If you could play the um, Bach prelude in the C sharp key now without playing the other one first. Sure. And see if people can hear the wonkiness. Did you hear the wonkiness, Diane? <laughs> I did. I'm wondering if Susan heard it more this time. I heard it in the playing, not in the intervals, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep working on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I think, you know, your mind, it's very interesting and Lynn, the reason I ask that is I think that your mind sort of internalizes or creates this geometry of a key and you sort of accept the C sharp minor more easily after having heard the other one. But if you hear it first, it sounds a little more out of sorts. Now, I don't know if that's if other people thought that or not, I would be curious to know. But because Lynn had said once when he was talking about connection or how you hear, I hate to use that word here, perceive um, something, that he, um, that it's the intervals, you hear sort of in a key that you're in, but you also hear the key that you're in in relation to do major that it's not simply pairwise, there's the action between one interval to the next. Then there's the note itself in relation to the key that you're in. And then there's the relation of that key back to do major, which I found really kind of wild to imagine your mind would be doing all that at once. But I actually was reflecting on how I heard it and realizing that in part you do kind of um, have the whole system in your mind and not just one particular key, which makes a difference how you would perceive that second one, if that makes any sense at all what I'm saying to you. It makes sense to me. It actually reminded me of what I wanted to say to Renee and I forgot, which is that um, what you brought up about dissonances, it's not just black and white, like bad and good. Out of context, I think it is. but who listens to intervals out of context, right? We're talking about music. And I once asked Mr. LaRouche, how can you tune a dissonance? Because you can. If you're working on a, a particular piece of music, you can tune that dissonance. There's a right, there's a place when it, there's a, a moment when that you can get that dissonance to lock in. Why? Um, and he said something um, similar to what Diana was just reporting. Um, you have to, the, the, the tuning of the dissonance is determined by the um, development of the, poly, the two polyphonic voices, the relations to the keys that they're in, and those keys relations to the whole musical system. So it's a, it's a much more complex space that gives a precise determination to something like a dissonance, which, if you think of it too simply, is just a clash. But, but there actually is a precise measurement of it. Great. Um, okay, we have another question in the chat here, Megan, from Kevin. Um, to return to your opening, it is really striking exactly how scientifically universal Kepler defines music 
in contrast to the absurd cultural relativism shown in the recent attacks on Beethoven. Can you say more? Yeah. Um, I mean, just on these cultural attacks, I mean, one thing I'll say is I read a couple responses from musicians, which were really sharp and insightful. Um, and really attacked the authors for being small-minded and limited, <laughs> to be kind. Um, so it's sort of clear. But, you know, I think um, what we're dealing with today in this, you know, in, in what these articles were saying about Beethoven's music and the, the Western musical system oppressing women and people of color and things like that, it completely denies um, the truth that there's a universality to human thought. Not that we all think the same. The beauty is that we don't, but there is truth that we can all come to know. We can all come to replicate discoveries in our mind and know them to be true. And it's not an opinion and that's not oppressive. That is beautiful. <laughs> that's incredible. Um, it's responsible for the progress of humankind. And so that's what this stuff is an attack on. It's an attempt to convince people that they're nothing but their sense perception. Their identity does not extend beyond their biology, which includes the color of their skin, where they're from, the so-called cultural niche they're supposed to be a part of, um, their language and so forth. And so anyway, I mean, that's what it is. And uh, Kepler obviously did not suffer from that despite the difficult circumstances he was living in. Okay, John Cavici, you have a question? Oh, yeah, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, well, a couple things. Uh, uh, I did not hear that dissonance in the C sharp one hardly at all. Did, maybe uh, because I don't, I don't listen to modern music, but maybe it somehow got into my mind or something. But so that, that was very peculiar. Um, and also, didn't Bach write? A C sharp, maybe it was a C sharp minor. Didn't he write a prelude of that? So I'm, I'm so that was, you know, well, I was kind of interested in that. Yeah, yeah, he did write. I mean, to me, I'll again. I think there is a certain limitation with the fact that I used a digital piano and we're I'm playing it for you over Zoom, but um, uh, yeah, no Bach. Was, oh, what I was going to say is, to me, it kind of sounds like like your piano tuner was drunk or something and <laughs> you know it's sort of like it's a honky tonk but um but no Bach did write a C sharp minor prelude more than one and there's nothing wrong with the key of C sharp minor but um by, I mean, by Bach's time and, and even by Kepler's time really nobody tuned their pianos or their organs in the kind of um tuning that I had my pianist friend play that in so and that that is why um that is that is called tempering right that's what a piano tuner does is to make small adjustments to the so-called perfect tuning of the piano strings such that um almost none of the intervals are the perfect mathematical intervals anymore but it makes it, it makes it the case that the strings can serve in many different keys and not only one or two. So I sort of played it in an old mode of a just temperament um, that, that you wouldn't hear today. And, and anyway, so but yeah, so Bach did write a C-sharp minor prelude, which is very beautiful. Well, well, now, can you play that fourth interval that you, that, that, that you, that you, that seemed to be dissonant to you? Or, you I know, can't, the, the, I can't right now. The file, I can't, just the way the file oh, is. Oh, 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 I see. It's just a file. You, you, you yeah. don't have the notes mm -hmm. there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so John Seegerson had something to say, and then we'll have you have closing remarks, Megan, if you have anything. John? Yeah, well, just two, 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 two questions. I mean, one on just elaborating on what Renee said about the orchestra. Keep in mind that even if, an orchestra, all the orchestral instruments are playing perfectly in a, say, an equal-tempered way, say they are, which they don't, 
but even if they were, you still get all sorts of nonlinear distances, distances because, and also with the human singing voice, because each, when you sing a tone, you're not just singing one tone, you're singing many, many different over, so-called overtones. Um, and it's, the, and each instrument has its own particular personality and also each human being because of the distribution of all those overtones. And depending on which are strong, those overtones are stronger or, or less strong. Uh, for instance, in the flute, you know, you have the very strong overtone of the of the octave of, of, of the octave, um, and they'll uh, that's that creates all sorts of clashes, uh, and that's that's why that's, that's one of the beauties of the of the of the classical orchestra is is that is that it it, it actually creates these kinds even with with two different instruments, say the flute and the bassoon playing together, you get a completely different, which Mozart absolutely loved, with that, uh, two, two octaves uh, separated. Um, you get, and he discovered that you had this incredible kind of tension, which is developed in that. That's the first thing. Um, on the, um, I wanted to ask you in terms of Kepler though, has anybody, uh, worked on, I mean, uh, it, you you touched on it from the standpoint of plasmas, but has anybody worked on uh, questions of harmonic ordering of larger structures in the universe, such as galaxies or clusters of galaxies uh, or clusters of galaxies? Um, I don't know, but I've wondered the same thing. I think it's a great question, and I think it's where we have to go. And I kind of, that comes back around to Joe's first question on the outer planets of our solar system. I don't really think you could, you probably can't answer that from just looking at our solar system. I think you do have to go to the higher order of the galaxy or maybe the, you know, multi-galactic system. So not that I'm aware of, although um, maybe um, if anybody knows, they should definitely send it my way, our way. And I think we could probably, I think it'll be a big fight, although maybe we'll find somebody who actually is in that um, area of study who would be provoked to do it. I think we would have to organize them. But that's, that's the direction I think we have to go. All right, thank you, Megan. That was really wonderful. Um, is there anything you'd like to, oh, let me just say a few things about upcoming events and then maybe you can send us off. Um, so next Sunday, we'll have a class on Beethoven's Compositional Method by Mihua Steger at 4.30 Eastern Time. And then October 4th, we have a music abend. Um, October at, 11th. Sorry, you're right, October 11th. Thank you. October 11th at 4.30. Um, so those are the upcoming events. And is there anything you'd like to say? Um, just that I, you know, I think especially now, um, with the state of the country and the world, I think um, it's more important than ever that we pull people into participating in something beautiful. Now, obviously, we're trying to do that with our chorus, even under the challenging circumstances of being apart. But I think also classes like this, classes like what Mihua will do next week, and the archive of the previous classes in this class series, we need to give people people's minds some real food <laughs> and, and really ennoble them and uplift them and help them think about things which are above the ugliness of the current circumstances and which are the kinds of things which have determined the course of human civilization. So I, I just want to say that and encourage people to help us bring more and more people into this process. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.